on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party What's up, party people? In the place to be is the BKMC Talib Kweli. You are now rocking with the best. It's the world's best podcast, the People's Party. I got my lovely and talented and beautiful and intelligent co-host, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? Hey, oh, oh for me? The applause is back. Yes, you back, baby. I love the live applause. <laughs> I'm loving the scully, too. Today's guest deserves his own applause. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, one of my favorite human beings, one of my favorite artists, a uh, fellow Brooklyn representative, a uh, guy who was born in Crown Heights but raised in Bed-Stuy, an actor, a rapper, a basketball fanatic, a ghost writer. You've heard him rocking with the best of the best of the best, from Apollo Brown to my man Torre to Knife One to the DJ Premier. He's got tracks with everyone from Dr. Dre to Jill Scott to Black Thought. Man, to Griselda, Pete Rock. He got a whole album with Pete Rock. Me and him did one of my favorite songs I've ever done. Spike Lee was my hero. Uh, he's on my new album, Gotham with Diamond D. This man has a resume. And did I mention that he loves basketball? Did I mention that? You said it. He's okay, a basketball okay. head. 13 mixtapes. He has an incredible run of mixtapes. He's my colleague. When they say steel, sharp, and steel, this is somebody who I think of. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on for a minute. I could go on forever. But we gonna get into it and start this conversation because this man has a new project called All the Brilliant Things. He also has great album titles too. Ladies and gentlemen, Sky Zoo is in the house. Give it up, Sky Zoo. Oh you. man, yeah. oh man, appreciate it, man. What's up, Sky Zoo? Wow, what do I say after all that? You know hey, what I mean? <laughs> thank, thank you, brother. When you said one of my favorite human beings, that meant more than everything else that you said, man. So I'm thank glad. you, brother. I appreciate you. And I meant that because you and me are not, we're not the type of friends who we're not on the phone every day, every week. Right. It's like that, but we've toured together. Yeah. We work together. We run in the same circles. Yeah. And the way in which you conduct yourself and the way in which you participate in this thing that we call hip hop is exemplary. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You know, and even from the friendship aspect, I mean, you the big homie to me. I, mm -hmm. I, I was in high school, you know, getting your joints and, and memorizing everything. You know right, what I mean? Right, right. And, you know, I feel like some people got friends they speak to three, four times a day and they don't like them. That's and true. then there's people you speak to right. once in the blue and you'll die for them. You That's know what right. I mean? So right. the, the time thing, even with my guys who I grew up with, that don't matter to me. Like, I can yeah. speak to my best friend once a month. I know he good. If I need him, he didn't, vice versa. It's love. You know it's what I mean? It's love. Where does bond? Um, I want to thank you for working with me on That's Enough on the Attack the Block mixtape that me and Z Trip did. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you work with me on the Gotham Attention Span. Yeah. Um, I want to get into your name. Yeah. Sky Zoo. Yep. Born Gregory Schuyler Taylor. Oh, man, Wikipedia. Nicknamed <laughs> by your parents, Sky Zoo. Yeah. After a song called Sky Zoo, mm -hmm. right, by the group Sky. Yep, 100%. Break that down. So uh, I was born in 82, and so I was a toddler, maybe like, you know, 84, 85. Mm -hmm. And Sky, the group from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. straight up disco group, and you know all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, yep. of course, because that's your era as well. You know, disco group from Brooklyn, they would put Sky on the beginning of all their albums or song titles, kind of their brand. And right. they had a record called Sky Zoo. And uh, it had a kazoo in the beat. And it went, I want my, my Sky Zoo. Right. Da -da 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 with the kazoo and all that, you know what I mean? And um, it was my family, like my cousins and my aunts, they would call me Sky Zoo as like a, a nickname. Oh, so then my, right. my aunt was in... Um, my aunt was in her little cruise and Flatbush and all that, and everybody right. would get their shirt with their names on it, and they got me a shirt with Sky's on the back and all that. I was like, was it four puffy years letters? Old. Yeah, it, it was the yeah, 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 like the the the, um, letters, the, the varsity letters. joints, kind of oh, you know, okay, what I mean? like okay, the, yeah. the felt joints. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, and the reason why it, it, the reason why they picked that name, you know, that song title, and linked it with my name is because with my name, my middle name is Skyler, mm -hmm. so Gregory Skyler Taylor, but everybody calls me Skyler. Like the only people that call me Gregory is like the tax man and the doctor. You know what I mean? Like everybody calls me Skyler, right. so it's Skyler or Sky for short. And then the Sky, Sky Zoo, it kind of connected, and it just stuck, man. So when I started rhyming later on, I knew nobody would have it. Right, mm -hmm. it's a dope name. I was like, nobody's gonna original. have it. Original. Thank you. Yeah. And and in the beginning, I caught flack. Like I remember taking meetings with labels, you know, when nobody knew who I was, and it would be like, "Yo, your music is so dope, but you should change your name." <laughs> and I was like, "Man, you got a Fifty Cent, you got right. an A Z, you got right. a Jay Z. What are we talking about? You right. know what I mean? Like, no vision at all. Yeah. What are we talking about? I was yeah. like, I'm not changing my name, and then it stuck. You know right. What I mean? I was about to commend you for remembering a song when you were four, but then I kept listening and I was like, oh, because of the nicknames. I'm like, that's, that's a great solely memory. why. That, that's right. solely why. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's solely why. But yeah, definitely. And the funny thing is, the amount of 
up and coming producers who've tried to chop that record and make it a beat for me is crazy, and it never comes out right. You know what I mean? It's never like, been right. It's just because it's, it's a weird obvious. beat. It's, it's not because the producers ain't dope. It's just a a, a hard record to flip. Right, so. but it's so it would be obvious. A of course, for producers, it's a like, dope shot to take yeah, if you're gonna yeah. shoot your shot. You know what I mean? Before you got to the point where you are now, you dropped out of college and took a job at Morgan Stanley. Yeah, they eventually let you go. Wow. And that's when you decided to really start your music career. Yeah. I also got let go from my job, and I was like, I'll do entertainment. Absolutely. AKA fired. But anywho, <laughs> why did you make the pivot? And was music always your passion point? Music was always my passion. I mean, I started rhyming when I was nine. And I wow. remember the day I started rhyming, uh, what was it, 91, 92, something like that. And um, Chi Ali, AJ ain't nothing but a number. On video music box. Shout out to Chi Ali. Chi Ali, we need you on the show, bro. Yeah, that, that's the bro yeah. right there. Yo, so it, it, was, it was Chi Ali, AJ, nothing but a number, video music box, and it came on, and I'm stuck. I'm just watching, like, this little kid, and I'm stuck, eyes open. And as soon as it ended, I said, Ma, I want to do that. Mm. And I never looked back. I never wanted to be nothing else. I did other things. I played ball. I ran around. Right. It was hip-hop. I was nine years old. Right. I was like, that's it. Like, the girls that's look what so I'm doing. good. Absolutely. <laughs> and and I, and I popped that tape three times, and I got the CD, the vinyl, the 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 actual cassette tape, everything. Like that started it. So just going back to to what you were saying, Jazz. You know, every job I had was just temporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I was like, I ain't doing this. Like this is because I don't want my mother beefing with me. I want my father beefing with me. I got to do something. But I'm doing this. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and since I was nine. Sometimes yeah. the universe has to push you so that 100%. you jump out. So you don't get complacent. Yeah, hundred mm -hmm. percent. I want to talk more about the new album later because, as you see, we go in early in your life. But yeah. you said something on the new album, um, a song, I Was Supposed to Be a Trap Rapper, which is a great song. Thank you. Right? Thank you. You said, picture James Baldwin in a room of Frank Lucas's. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's an apt description of your title. Thank you. What made you put those two things together? That's the world I grew up in. You know, I, I grew up in a neighborhood with friends who really was outside doing things. And, you know, when these are your friends, you rubbing shoulders with them every day. You caught up in the mix with them at times and you in the thick of the jungle with them, mm -hmm. you know. And um, for me, I had this whole other side of me based on I had two parents. I actually had three parents. You know, I had my moms, my pops and my stepmoms who I don't call a stepmom. I just call her my mother as right. well because we that close. So I was fortunate and blessed enough to live in a house where... I never saw my parents together. Mm -hmm. It was my my pops and my second mom and then my mom's like two different cribs, but I had three parents guiding me. So mm -hmm. I would go outside with my best friends and run around and, and be in the mix, but I also had that at home. So for me, like I said, it was like picture James Baldwin in the room with Frank Lucas's and Nikki Barnes's and all of their influences. Yeah. You know, like that's the world I was in. I'm this guy who's writing and, and I'm in advanced placement classes in English, but I'm sitting on a step and I'm sitting in the hallway and I'm outside running in and out of corner stores and all that with these same guys who are running the neighborhood or become wind up becoming that later on. And it's just this ill juxtaposition that my music has always been about. Like, how come some of us went this way and some of us went that way? When we from the same place, we off the same tree, different right. branches. What's the meaning behind that? You know, I always felt like my music was a, a big sociology experiment, you know, wow. and, and that that line goes into it. My father's sociology professor, my mother's an wow. English professor, and I always felt like those two uh, vocations, mm -hmm. those two, like, disciplines, like, take a sociology professor and an English professor, black, put them in New York in the 1970s, yeah. and that's how you get a rapper like me. So mm -hmm. I'm like your younger brother yeah. in the 80s because English, I was an English major. I love sociology. I'm like your younger brother. Boom. That's what it Look is. Look at that. You know? <laughs> Word. So your rhymes about basketball are unparalleled because you actually have a love for the game. Yeah. Um, some people might not know you even write for a series for a slam called Chain Link Champions. Mm -hmm. Where did your love for the game start and what are your five favorite basketball bars? Ooh. So as far as basketball, yeah, just growing up in the neighborhood. You know, I feel like when, when you live in, in, in a city and you live in certain places, that's all they give you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a basketball court on every corner. That's right. It's the least expensive sport in the world. It takes one person and one ball. You know, you look at baseball, you need a group of friends, you need equipment, you need this. That's, that's expensive. That's so true. You know, you look at soccer, you look at football, it's expensive. That's, that's why there's a basketball court on every corner. It's cheap, you know. Yeah. So just growing up in the neighborhood, I played ball almost as much as I rapped as a little kid. You know what I mean? So it just stuck. It just stuck with me. I'm a huge basketball fan. It's a great escape. It's a great way to put all the nonsense of whatever else may be going on with work, 
you know, and I hate to call my career and my passion work, but at times it is work, and you know that. So, you know, it's a great escape and to continue to just tap into that other love. And same thing with jazz. Like, everybody know I'm a huge jazz head. You know, that's another escape, you know? We're all from New York, so I think we all grew up seeing this. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to Centennial Park and, like, watch all the guys playing the basketball games, listening to the shit talk, all yeah. that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, we grew up, grew up on the court. I used to go out in the snow, shovel the snow off the court, and f freestyle while I would shoot free throws. Dedication. Like real life at like 13, 14, I'd just go off the head rhyming while I'm wow. shooting dolo with the shovel on the side. Like <laughs> wow. that's just what it was. And I was a kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. You were not afraid to wear your influences on your sleeve. Yeah. You were very good about being like, this is what I was listening to. Mm -hmm. This is where I got this from. Yeah. This is my influence. This is my inspiration. It's all through your music. Yeah. And there's so many layers to it. I hear John Forte in mm. you and I know that doesn't sound obvious right but the reason is because John Forte when he was making uh, he was making a certain type of mainstream style of rap that was popular mm -hmm. popularized by Biggie and 95 94 95 bad boy yeah. and then later like you know Jada Kiss when Jada Kiss and Beanie Siegel and them was on the mixtapes yeah. that era and um you've spoken about Nas Jizza yeah. being yeah. influences but you have a song called 95 bad boy ever and your rhymes yeah. are littered with yeah. references to not just Big, but Diddy and Big and their relationship absolutely you know what I'm saying yeah why is it so important for you to pay homage in that way it's important because I feel like that's how you continue to keep this culture and this thing going. Mm -hmm. You know, you you got to know where all this came from and where it started. And like mm -hmm. you said, I, I have no problem saying, yo, this person influenced me, right. that person. I, I think we live in an era where, you know, you feel like, oh, if I say so-and-so is the reason why I rhyme like this mm -hmm. or so-and-so inspired me, then you giving it up and that knocks you down. Not at all. Right. Like, that's corny. Right. That's, that's stupid. Corny I mean, there's so many people that are moving that are like some of the biggest artists in the world who've come to me and been like, yo, Sky, you the reason why I rhyme like this. Yo, mm -hmm. you the reason why. It's crazy. Like, names that people would be blown away by. But, you know, I feel like sometimes people feel like if they give it up publicly, then it becomes a different thing. And nah, mm -hmm. man. Right, like, right, you right. know, and no matter who it is. So I'll tell heads, yo, listen, I remember the day I bought Black Star. Mm. The day. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. I remember that day in September. You know what I mean? In okay. high school. And, you know, I, I remember that You know, because it definitely came out of September, too. 28th, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's the day September before my 28th. birthday. Yeah, September 28th. Yeah. It was you, it was Equimini, and it was um, it was Jay, Volume 2. Beats, Rhymes, and Life. No, Love Movement came out that day. Wow, I forgot that Foundation one. by Brand Nubian came out that day. Wow, yes, wow. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that dropping. Dag, that's crazy. Because yeah. we, all, we all bought the Jay joint, mm -hmm. and then me and my man was like, all right, one of us going to buy Outcast, one go buy Black Star, right. and we just swap it out. You right, know what I mean? Right. So That's like, what you had to do back in the day. Yeah. So then right. I, I bought Outcast. My man bought Black Star, but I knew we was gonna swap it out, and I never gave it back. You know what I <laughs> mean? Like, and I kept the old, the same one. Me and my best friend copped in '98 is the one at my house now. Wow. I never That's gave beautiful. it back. I was like, Nah, he's dead on that. That's you know beautiful. what I mean? Like, That's yeah, beautiful. absolutely. What I will say is that nobody can ever blame smoking too much for having a bad memory because Talib, your memory is superb. It really isn't. You'd be surprised at the amount of shit I've done forgot. Probably in, in your <laughs> day to day, but as far as yeah. long term. The shit that's important, I, I remember. That's what it is. You mentioned uh, Bad Boy and, and Puff and all that, and I, I would love to touch on that. Because I think it's funny that a lot of people look at me in a certain light, quote unquote, underground or backpack, mm -hmm. rap, whatever you want to call it, because of the type of beats I pick or the records that I choose not to make mm -hmm. as opposed to the records I choose to make. Mm -hmm. But I grew up on on Big Block. I was yeah, surrounded by Bad Boy. Yeah, St. I was James surrounded Lickers. by yeah. Bad. You know what I mean? I was surrounded by Junior Mafia. We would sit on the step and Kim would walk by. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That was normal. We wow. would go to the store, play fighting, sharing a hero, and Big would be shooting dice. Like, that was normal mm -hmm. to us, you know? So how can I not be influenced by those guys? Like, my neighborhood was Bad Boy World. I mean, you know so for I mean? me, at that time, my best friend Juju lived on St. James and Fulton at the time, right? Up so the block. I went to P. I went to... I went to Summit Junior High School, which is a PS11, right? <laughs> yep. And then for my last year of Summit, I went to IS113. <laughs> That's right? crazy. So it was in the neighborhood. I was in, I was in that neighborhood That's as crazy. a kid. So I'm, you know, I'm on the 25 bus. Mm -hmm. My father was teaching College of New Rochelle. Mm. So for me, when I was start, when that music started coming out, I was working for Jessica Rosenblum. Okay. Who was Puff's partner. Right, 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 right. And so I would go to parties. It would be me and John Forte and C Knowledge from Diggable Planets. Mm -hmm. And we go to the party and be big and Tupac. 
Mm. You know, or that's be crazy. that's like that's you know what I'm saying? Like so that whole like ninety four to ninety seven, yeah. I was in the clubs, I was in the tunnel, yeah. I was at I was at a uh, supper club. Yeah. You know, I was I was working essentially for Funkmaster Flex because mm. Jessica was managing Flex enough. Big Cap, Budokan, Mad Wayne, and Bismarcky. Wow. And those are the DJs. It was Flip Squad DJs. Right, right. So, wow. Yeah, I was at the Palladium. I was a kid, but I remember all yeah. the names on the radio, yep. When we came out, people looked at us as the anti-Puffy. But when I came out, I had I knew Puff. Right. I had a relationship. He was in that mix. Yeah, he was this in is that my mix. peoples. Yeah. I didn't look at it as what we was doing as separate or different. The fans did. I always say that, yeah. bro. I always say the fans are who divide it all. Mm-hmm. And they think they got the right intentions, which is great. Yeah. So it's weird. Yeah. But it's a tug of war because you want to salute them because you got the right intentions because you want the quote unquote real or what you think is the real, which you know you classify as us, to win. But the division always comes from the fans, yeah. man, because they don't know we listen to this and those guys listen to us and whatever, whatever. You know, like somebody asked me the other day, they was like, yo, you know, with your music, you make hip hop, but you've added like a sophistication to it with the type of beats you pick and the fact that you always add live trumpets and string sections. Mm-hmm. And where did that come from? And I was like, one, I'm a jazz head. And two, it came from Puff. From Puff. It yeah. came from Puff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And without ever meeting Puff a day in my life, it came from the fact that I was such a bad boy head as a graffiti kid growing up doing graffiti my whole life, I used to tag bad boy. Like I would tag guys who on the train and I would tag bad boy. You know what I mean? Like right. I was such a graph head and I was such a bad boy guy at that age. Puff and them could do no wrong in my right. eyes, you know? So when Puff was adding strings to Somebody Gotta Die and I Love You Baby and Victory and all that, as a 14 year old, I was like, that's what it's supposed to sound like. Right. I was blown away right. by that. Like right. nobody was adding strings to hardcore street records about, you know, one dude's in my eye, that's Jason. Ain't no slugs right. gonna be wasted. Revenge of feeling at the tip of my lips. I can't wait to put my clip in his hip. And you hear these strings in the bed, like, yo, he's yeah. talking the most heinous corner store, shoot you up. And he got these beautiful strings he behind said he was it. making movies. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and when I heard that, I was like, when I make music, that's what it gotta be. I gotta have that quote unquote sophistication without even using that word back then. I was like, that's what I gotta do. So it all came from Puff, man. I tell people as much as I grew up on you guys and, you know, when I say you guys, obviously you and most and, you know, the genius and Jay and Nas, May showed me how to write records without even knowing. I'm a yeah. huge Mace fan. You know what I mean? May showed me how to go from just being in a lunchroom, my man banging on the table and me spitting 100 bars, to structure an eye, 16 bar, a hook, 16 a hook. I got that from Murder Mace. You yeah. know what I mean? So, like, there's this, again, this juxtaposition of, I guess, James Baldwin and Frank Lucas. That's you know right. What I mean? That's like, right. You know what it yeah. is? Um, I feel like as fans, the competitiveness, because the same thing as when you're watching basketball, it's like you want your player to be better than the other player. So it's like you want your rapper to be better yeah, than the other rapper. Some of that, like a, a lot of that is really fun and really the fuel that drives the culture. Mm-hmm. If the fans didn't passionately debate, right. it, it wouldn't no be as, as, as sweet for us. Right, right. So we did some of it, we got to appreciate it. That's yeah. why I say it's a yeah. tug of war. Some, exactly. some of it is like, yeah... That helps us and that's dope and we appreciate it. You got the right intentions, but then the rest of it is like, yo, we really rock with these guys. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, that's where the social justice part comes into yeah. it. Because it's like healthy competition, shit talking, all that. My man is better than your man. Yeah. My team yeah. is better than your man. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we want all black people who come from where we come from to, to succeed. Yeah. So even if you make a record that I don't like or don't resonate with me, right. as an artist, mm-hmm. I know how hard it is to make that record. Yeah. So right. it's like, okay, that might not be for me, right. but, but it's good shit, you did it. Right. Congratulations. And, and it that's how it off, is. And you changed your mother life and your father life right. and your kids' lives. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So absolutely. Absolutely. You've got a great working relationship with the legendary Knife Wonder. You guys cooked up Cloud Nine, a three-day high, in mm-hmm. just three days, yeah. and that obviously takes skill. What was the workflow and relationship like? Uh, I met Ninth in 05 through my man Sean Don of the Justice League. I met Dunny first, who's Sean Don. I met him first. He introduced me to the whole Justice League at the time. It was like 04, 05. Met Ninth in 05, and we kind of just hit it off real nice. And he would always give me beat CDs, you know, early on. I'm a dude working at, you know, Kinko's and then working at Morgan Stanley. Like, I'm a guy on, on the right. C train, you know what I mean, on right. the E train and, you know, whatever. Like, and, and he would give me, I had Jay-Z's new hot producer giving me beat CDs and I'm just some guy on the train, you know. So I had that going and, and I had all these beat CDs that I had never done anything with. And one day something just hit me like, yo, go through them CDs son always give you and mm-hmm. really start just listening. And I just found all these beats that I never touched. And I was like, I gotta do something with these. And I did like nine joints in two days in New York. Then I booked a trip to North Carolina. I hit him like, yo, I want to come out. He was like, yeah, yeah, come out. And I didn't tell him what, what I did. I just pulled up. 
That's smart. And I hit him with a CD, like, yo, put that in your pocket. Because he used to always be like, yo, Scott, right. put that in your pocket. And it'd be a bunch right. of beats. So I hit him with his move. I was like, yo, put that in your pocket, bro. He was like, all right. And he called me the next day, like, yo, what is this CD? This is bananas. Like, what are we doing with it? I was like, yo, whatever you want to do. And he was like, yo, let's finish this shit today. And then we did three songs in a day. So it became 12 songs in three days. And it was just three an EP. High. Yeah, the three-day high. 12 yeah. songs, three days. And we just ran through it. Boom, boom, boom. I did the majority of it on my own, and it was just showing initiative, you know, being mm-hmm. from the K, being from Brooklyn, it was always about going for it and getting it in the hustle and just showing that initiative, like, yo, I want this shit, so it's right. whatever, you know and what I mean? And going down there. 100%, you yeah. know what I mean? So I did that, and then we just continued to build from there, and you know, that. but that's how it all started. So I always tell people, you know, regardless of anything, Son is where this all started at. You know, nice. I remember I remember 50 saying before when, when he first got on, I'm from New York, and it took a L.A. guy and a Detroit guy to put me on as opposed to New Yorkers. And I felt that because for me, it was like, yo, I'm from New York and it took a North Carolina guy to put me on. When I'm in New York, I'm in the mix, but it took a North Carolina guy to help put me on. You know what I mean? And the same thing with me and High Tech. High Tech obviously didn't have the success that Knife Wonder had or that Dre and Eminem had when he started working with me. And so I guess it's mutual with us, but it was me over them High Tech beats, not over a New York producer. Right. That I got on because of that. Tech is so bananas, too. Jesus Christ, he's nuts. He's one of the few I haven't gotten with yet. He sent me stuff way back, but we ain't get to really, really cook yet. That would sound good together. Yeah, I I need that. But Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, man. The Salvation came out with Jamla and with Duck Down, right? Yep. Um, So at this point in your career, you're like, okay, I have all these relationships. I got to figure out a way to make them all work. Yeah. Was there any friction with that or you were able to just... No, no. What happened was uh, I hit I hit nine. First, I, I did the duck down deal. I was about to do the duck down deal. And uh, Sean Price really pushed that. My brother, Sean P., rest, rest in, in peace. peace. I remember him saying that, you know, he was telling Drew and Buck, like, yo, we got to get Sky. We, we got to get Sky. We don't want to yeah. see him go nowhere. I was starting to take meetings with labels mm-hmm. and majors, indies, whatever, whatever. And, and you know, Drew was like, nah, Sean, we're going to do the deal. Mm-hmm. And Sean was like, yeah, do the deal, bro. Like, we, we get Sky. He's the new young guy coming yeah. up. He's crazy, whatever. So at the same time, I'm starting to work on my joint, my debut. This my my big debut joint. And you take your whole life to make it. And I remember I hit ninth, and I was like, yo, I got all these beats from you. You got to be on this album because none of this would be possible without you. How much you want per beat? He had never charged me for a beat at that point because it was just crew love. He was like, man, I don't even know what to charge you, bro. Like, we fam. You've you been in my house. You know yeah. what I mean? So he was like, yo, I could charge you, but I'm starting this label thing. If you could jump it off and be the first artist and help mm. me get this label off, I got a few other acts, whatever, whatever, but you already established. If we could jump this off even Stevens and I was like bro absolutely let's do this okay. Biggie Puffy shit let's do yeah. it you know what I mean so that's how it happened so then I was like yo I'm about to you know ink this deal with Duck Down he was like yo I'm talking to Duck Down right now about distribution for Jamla and I was like oh okay. it's perfect okay. it's yeah, already yeah, yeah. done it's perfect you know shout what I mean shout out to and Drew and Noah yeah. and Buckshot Buckshot you know what I'm saying hold Duck Down yeah. and the Jamla crew which I also did a record with them, the Indy 500 record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, in 2015, you dropped Music for My Friends, yeah. which I felt personally was for me. Oh. Nice. <laughs> I never knew that. Word yeah, up. I mean, I'm your friend, right? We well, friends. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Nice. Jada Come Kiss on, is on it. West Side Gun is on it. Yeah. Uh, Saba's on it. Friend of mine, uh, K. Cola's on it. Yes. Uh, great artist. Shout out to Cola out here. Um, I love that you wrote it from the perspective of the 13-year-old yeah. version. Thank you. Why, why did you do that? My music's always been about going back to figure out what's happening moving forward. You know, it's always, there's a lot of reflection. Yo, Scott talks about 95 and that, that first of all, 95 was the greatest year ever in the history of mankind. Okay. Uh, but, I'm going to uh, go with 88, but we can have that I'm conversation. Like because that's Because of the era. Oh, we're at the era, that's right. Right, you know what that's I'm saying? Right. Like, okay, 95, I, I was 13. Okay. I was running around, you know 95, what I mean? I, in my book, I have a chapter called 1995. Yeah. There's a chapter of my book called 1995. Yeah. Because my summer of 1995, I took a Greyhound bus out to LA. Oh, that was that summer. To try to battle... California rappers, like that's how I was on it. Yeah, you know what your ninety five was everything, yeah. man. You know what I mean? But um, so you know, my music's always been about taking a look back to see mm-hmm. what's gonna happen when we go forward. It's mm-hmm. always been kind of the basis of where I'm at with it, amongst other things. And um, it just hit me. It was like I was dealing with a time where the industry was being weird, and you know, you start realizing 
who your friends are and who's not. And when mm-hmm. you come into the industry, you think you met this guy, you met this person, whatever, whatever, and everybody's your friend and everybody got the right intent. And then you start figuring out what it is and the smoke clears and, you know, you start seeing through certain charades and facades and all that. And I was like, yo, man, none of these motherfuckers is my friend, B. Like, it's mm-hmm. about my real friends who don't know nothing about a rap except what I do, you know, and I just... The title just hit me, Music for My Friends, and then I just went there. And I was like, I'm going to literally just talk about being 13, growing up in certain environments. Because I feel like as a young black man, when you're 13, that's when you really start to cross over into certain things, right? Like there's this whole tug of war between, you know, you're becoming a man. Your voice is starting to change. You're starting to notice girls in a different way. You have more responsibilities. But then you're still... Asking your parents, you know, you're giving your parents a Christmas list. Right. So, there, you know, it's this tug of war yeah, when you're 13. Yeah, yeah. 13 is a wild age, yeah. you know, like you're a teenager, like that's it. You know, you you feel like you grown, but then you still got to be in the house at a certain time. You're still eating cereal Saturday mornings. Like 13 is weird, you know what I mean? Yeah. Eighth, eighth grade is a weird, and, and it's you very got crucial. And shit. Yeah, it's very crucial. <laughs> you're getting a little stage. fuzz, you know what I mean? Girls is developing differently and yeah. you're noticing that. Also, and, they didn't do that stage. Yeah, like th- 13. <laughs> I kept is, a journal when I was 13. Mm. And boy, is it a cringy read these days. <laughs> you know, tell him. <laughs> well, you look back like, yo, what was that? You what know the what I mean? What like, was I thinking? Right. Like I, the- too co- I too had a journal, <laughs> but I used to like write lies in it because I felt like my you told, you life was not interesting enough. You told me right. this before. <laughs> so when you look back, you could look like, oh, I was popping yeah, when I was, I was 13. I thought if I, I die, mean? someone would read my diary. Right. And I, I was obsessed with diary, Frank, but you know. <laughs> but yeah, so 13 is such a wild <laughs> age, and especially as a young black kid in the inner city, and in so many ways you can get pulled, and a lot of us do get pulled in those ways. Ways. Yeah. And I just started talking about that. And it shapes you. Like, whatever you experience around that time is going to make you go this way or that way or whatever it is. Like, 13 is, is, is a serious milestone. So it just hit me to really zone in on that. And, and that's, that's what I did. That's a great point. That is a great point. Thank you. Um, you have a great song, one of the greatest in your uh, catalog, and a catalog of incredible songs. Thank you. With uh, Money Makes Us Happy. Yeah. With Black Thought and, and Bilal. Bilal. Yeah. That song is dealing with people's complicated relationship with money. Mm-hmm. As certain sects of hip hop become more socialistic and anti capitalist, mm-hmm. as someone who is so influenced by the capitalistic rap of Bad Boy era, mm-hmm. where do you stand on that conversation? I get both sides of it. You know, I mean, money makes this whole thing move. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter how much certain artists or certain people want to be in tune with this or in tap with that, or, you know, I'm this and that, at the end of the day, like, if you have a career doing XYZ, you're not moving without that PayPal going through. You know what I mean? Like, you're yeah. not moving. Regardless of how much an artist or, or a creative mind want to promote that, oh, I don't do this, da-da-da-da-da, and I'm about this and this. If that PayPal or that cash app don't ring off, you're not leaving home. You That's know, right. so there's this there's this balance, and I think everything in life is a tug of war. It's pros and cons, and there's, you know, I understand both sides of it, you yeah. know? Yeah, I think for us as artists, we have a certain privilege in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because I think, and I'm not like a scholar on this subject, and I probably should study it more before I even bring it up in conversation. But I bring it up because of the message of that song. Right. But I think with art, because we are creating something from our brain and it's like intellectual property, it's more of like a a barter thing where it's like, it's it's not necessarily capitalism if you're trading your art Mm-hmm. For other things, whether it be for favors or for you know money mm-hmm. or for whatever it is, yeah. obviously if we're in, we're born in America, we grew up in a system that's capitalist. Yeah. So obviously some of this system is just on us, in us, no matter what we try right, to do. Right. By the nature of us living in America, for you to fly from New York to L.A., mm-hmm. you have supported a capitalist system. It don't matter what, just by default. That's real. Whether you agree with it, and or whether not. you have a choice or not. Yeah, yeah just by real. living in America. That's real. You know, and yeah. um. When you every transaction, when you go in and buy a candy, candy bar, you pay tax on it, whatever. Yeah. Like you're supporting that. There's system. no way to get around it. With hip hop, it's this thing now where you have a a sect in hip hop that is socialistic in nature, which I applaud because I mean Martin Luther King is a democratic socialist. Mm-hmm. Martin Luther King said in a quote, "I'm a lot more socialistic in my thinking." Than I am. I feel like capitalism has worn out his welcome. I, that's, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said I feel like capitalism is outdated or whatever. But with hip hop, I feel like sometimes hip hop artists get shamed for having new money mm-hmm. from some of the more left 
socialistic aspects without right. understanding the circumstance in which these rappers grew up in. Right. Maybe they don't have the academic privilege or the understanding of the world to understand how capitalism affects poor people all over the world. Right. And that by by promoting capitalism, they, they can be harmful right. to marginalized people. Yeah, no, I dig yeah. it. You know, I, f- I feel like, you know, with the whole thing with money and especially with that song and, and just going back to all of that, I feel like, you know, there's nothing wrong with making money off of your art mm-hmm. or, or or your mind or whatever it is that you're doing. I think that you draw the line in the sand where it's like, all right, what are you willing to give up for this? Right. And, and it's a, what, again, it's a privilege because right. some people just got to go to fuck to work. Yeah. Some people absolutely. don't can't think of a song that can make money. They just got to get a job right. that they got to go to a job that they hate yeah. just to pay the bills. Anybody that could change their life and their family's lives and those close to them's lives by doing what they love or whatever they have to do or mm-hmm. whatever it takes. And they say, you know what, whatever it takes, I got to go all out. You got to come in that. But my thing is, like I said, you just draw the line and what you're willing to do. It doesn't mean you don't go out there and get it. It means, okay, I'm not willing to do this much to get it. Let me figure out a way to do something else that yeah. I can look in the mirror and be cool with while I go get it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I did a movie and bought a house off it. Like, yeah. I'm not going to feel bad about that. You crazy? Like, I right. took my son out of the sty. You know Word what I mean? Up. And, like, Word put up. him in the suburbs. Word clean up. supermarkets. Backyard. No two, two backyards and, and playground and, and in my house. Man. No doubt. Are you enjoying Atlanta? Yeah, it's dope. It's dope, no. man. I love it. I love it. You know, I'm still New York through and through. That's never going to change, you know. But I love being the guy that I go outside and my neighbors don't know what I do. Word. They don't know who I'm cool with or who I ghost right for or what I did or what I got going on. I'm just a guy that go check the mail, water the lawn, Word. and hey, that guy's all right. He's a nice guy. Next right. door. I don't know what he does, but he's a nice guy. Right, hey, right, how you right. doing, Jimmy? Like, and that's it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it, it's dope, man. It's dope. I, I took my son out of bed style. Boom. No doubt. Can't nobody tell me nothing. No you know doubt. I mean? And you love the style. Yeah. But you 100%. understand what it is about 100%. S- raising a family. Yeah. Going back to your days of starting. You at one point were living in Far Rockaway? Not Far Rockaway, Southside. Southside, South Side, Jamaica, Queens. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Southside, my second home. So shout out to Southside. Rest in peace, Chinks. And um, bundles. Yeah, stack bundles. Yeah. You were uh, harassed by the police on your way from Chinks' uh, funeral. funeral. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you documented that for us. Yeah. Um, Grits Gang, greatest rappers in the streets, for those yeah. that don't know. Yeah. You were stack bundles. Yeah. Tell me, for people who don't know who he is, yeah. about why his legacy is so important to hip-hop. Oh, man, this whole wave that you see going on of just, like, fly street rap, that was him. Right. He'd been on that. Right. You know what I mean? We was 17, 18. He would come to the studio with a blue mink on. Mm-hmm. Right. With the, with the mink hat. With the right. blue mink hat. Right. You know what I mean? We in there with fly academic suits, sweatsuits, <laughs> and, and Jordans. He'd come in with a white tee down to his knees and a blue mink at, right. like, 18. You know? Like, that. that's who he was. So, like, this whole fly street rap. He was fly like that. Looked like he could have been Goldie or something, but then he'd be right. rhyming about taking your head off. You know what I mean? Like, right, with the bars, was, though. Right, and he Bar was lyrical, out. and he was super nice, yeah. and he and then he had the long hair, and the, yes, sir, and all that. Like, he, it's a lot of things going on right now that he was on early, that right. he started and he was a part of, and that he was on early. And he was out of him, and he, he was right there. He was out of him, man. I remember, yeah. I remember when he first got with Clue, we was in Sue's together. We was in, before they closed. Sue's Rondé. Yeah, we was in Sue's together. And Those was, were the days. Yeah, he was like, yo, I just, I mean, we was in Sue's. He was like, yo, Sky, I just, I just linked up with Clue. I just did the deal with Clue. Word, boom, boom, whatever, whatever. And then, like, we just always just, you know, we was 17, 18 in, in that crew, man, in the grits. And then it just, you know, we just continued to grow. And even when we all started doing separate things, we still was crew, of course. We still was homies. And just seeing where he went with it and where he was about to go and the loyalty he had to Far Rockaway and all that, you know what I mean? And then you saw with him with Chinks and Bino and Cole and mm-hmm. making sure those guys had a lane and them being able to take off and do their thing. And it just was love, man. And it's awful that he's not here. But his impact is felt. I mean, you're talking about a guy who didn't get to drop an album. Right. It was just mixtapes, freestyles, and that stuff is still ringing off. Yeah. He died in 07. I remember when I got that call. You know what I mean? Right. Like, And for that stuff to still be ringing off 14 years later is insane. Word up. Yeah. Rest in peace, Stack Bundles. Yeah. Word and Chinks, word is fine. Both of them, absolutely. All right, so Apollo Brown produced albums for both you and Shay Noir. One of those songs was Follow the Wisdom. Yeah. And on that song, can you talk to me about your take from the song and collaborating with Shay Noir? Great record. Shay Noir is ridiculous. Shout out yeah, to Shay she Noir. Is. She's insane. Really, really, really like her as an MC. Not a female MC, a MC, yes. period. You know what I mean? Like Word. just what she's what she's capable of doing. And of course, Apollo's a legend, man. That, that's my brother. He's that's, so busy. 
Yo, he don't stop. <laughs> he don't stop. Yeah, I, Apollo do like four or five whole albums a year. Man, I Damn. love that yeah. anchovies. <laughs> him and Planet Asia. I yeah. cannot get enough. Yeah, yeah. He 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 go to war, man. Mm. Uh, it was a dope time doing that record. You know, uh, like I said, Apollo is my family. Shay Noir is really really dope, and she's really making a lot of waves. And when they sent it to me, I was with it right away. You know, um, I just love seeing that continuous movement from Apollo, who I've done a ton of work with, and whose family, and love seeing what Shay's doing and. Yeah, it was dope. I think it's dope on that song called Follow the Wisdom that mm -hmm. you followed the wisdom. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. she dropped her bars and then here you come. Yeah, with me, everything mm. is tailor-made. Yeah. You know, so like if, if we do a record, you say, yo, Scott, it's the record, boom, boom. I don't have a stash of verses. Yo, I got this verse I wrote two weeks ago. Let me right. get at the choir. Like I don't have that. So everything is going to fit that beat, yes. that energy, that mode, that concept. The same thing when I, when I do my records, a lot of people may or may not know, I write everything on the spot. So I don't write at home. And, and to all the writers and rappers and people listening, like, there's no right or wrong way to That's do right. it. Yeah. You know, my, my man Mo's King, Def, one, one, get one of the greatest ever said, I write around, sometimes I don't finish for days. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, there's no right or wrong method. But for me, I write everything on the spot. And, you know, I don't write at home, you know, before I go to the lab or two weeks later. I don't get a gang of beats and write to them for a month and then go. And, you know, I write everything on the spot. And, um... Funny story about that, man. When me and Apollo did the Easy Truth, mm -hmm. Apollo's method, the way he works with people, if you do an album with you, he'll send you a bunch of beats like three months out. And he'll let you write for three months. And then you go to Detroit for like three, four days and just mass Tighten record. Yeah, just mass record mm -hmm. everything. All right, we here together. You got your rhyme book full of rhymes. Let's do it. And you record five, six, seven songs a day. And in two, three days, you're done. Wow. So when we, we set all that up, he sent me like 40 beats. And I was like, all right, word, I'm going to pick them, pick 14, 15 joints, and we go from there. He was like, cool, so I'll book you a trip, come down for four days. I said, yeah, I'm going to need a little more than that. He was like, what's up? I was like, I write everything on the spot. So he was like, yo, you're going to be in Detroit for like two months. The <laughs> hotel fee is going to be crazy. The rental car is going to be crazy. I said, bro, I promise you we're going to get this thing done in two weeks. He was like, no way, no way. You're not going to be able to do this in two weeks. I said, bro, I promise you. This is how I work. I'm the fastest writer you ever seen. We're going to get this whole album done in two weeks. We got the album done in nine days. Right up. We had all these extra days. We went to the Motown Museum. We was hanging out. We have nothing to do. You know what I mean? Right like, up. And he was just like, yo, I can't believe you did this shit in nine days, bro. I was like... I told you, man, I write on the spot. I wasn't going to write all that shit in two days, but you know what I mean? Right, I right, was right. like, give me give me two weeks and we're going to knock this out, you know? No so um, just going back to that, everything is tailor-made. Even with the ghostwriting, everything is tailor-made, you know? No doubt. Like I said, you're not scared to share your influences. Yeah. And you are incredibly inspired and influenced by black television, black images on TV, from Absolutely. The Wire to The Cosby Show. Absolutely. Uh, to your love for Spike Lee. Absolutely. Um, why for you is the representation of the black family mm -hmm. in the media so important? And what did you feel like as a young black kid seeing from Brooklyn, yeah. seeing Spike Lee do his thing? Well, the first part of the question, it took forever for us to be on TV screens and be in films and for those images and stories to matter. It was like, oh, that's that black thing. It's a black show. Now it's a show. Mm -hmm. Now it's a movie as opposed to the black show, the black movie, whatever it is. You know, it took forever for us to get that and be represented on TV and show all of our different ways of life. Some of us are doing bad, some of us are doing good. Obviously, doing bad is going to get more light because it's entertaining to those yeah, yeah. who don't look like us. But that's where different world and all that came in and say, wait a minute, you know, mm -hmm. even to me where I wanted to go to a black college, I didn't go to a black college, but I wanted to, my right. fam couldn't afford it. But Shout out to Alvin Toussaint and all them. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like I I wanted to yeah. do all that because I was inspired by that, you know. And then with Spike in particular, man, you know, Brooklyn, the style, the neighborhood, it just and then jazz. It was everything that I'm about and that I love. And then from a kid, you know, my pops got me on all that. My pops would take me to see a movie and he would make me write a book report on it. Yeah. Oh, that's my mom. Like, you know what I mean? Like, my mom did that to me too. Yo, I had to write a book report on yeah. Boys in the Hood. I had to write and it's weird saying a book report. And that movie ended report. up all throughout your milestones album, yeah. which is about your pops. And my son and, and fatherhood. Your son and, and, black, fatherhood yeah, absolutely. and black male mentorship. Absolutely. All that's in there. Yeah, which I, I would love to get into. But like, you know, my pops made me write a report on Boys in the Hood. He made me write a report on Malcolm X. Like, you know, all those things. And and 
doing that, it just zoned me into all of that. And I would look on the screen and, and, and see my life and see my neighborhood, you know? Yeah. And, and that's what, especially with Spike. I mean, to me, Spike is the GOAT. You know that. We did a record about it. You know that's what I mean? Right. Spike is the GOAT. You Thank know? you for and, having me on that record because man. I feel the same way you do about Spike Lee. So yeah. to be able to express that and be in the video with him, I didn't. I had never met him before that. I didn't and, know that. And then I met, and then I was able to start a conversation with him behind that record. Wow. And now he, that's why he's in the Travel and Light video. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's so crazy. Ah, oh, come on. You yeah. already. I remember when we did the joint, because we did we did a record for it was a tape you was doing. And I came to the lab. Yo, come through, boom, boom. I came to the lab and we did the verse. I did the verse and we did the record. And then you was like, yo, what you working on? And I pulled out a flash drive and just played joints. And I remember you being like, yo. If you need me on something, I'm with that. I didn't know I did that, but yeah. that's good. And I was like, hell yeah, like absolutely. Because like, I think I remember like, dun, 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 like yeah. that song is one of my favorite songs. Tall Black been Guy. On. Tall Black Guy did that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I remember I was playing joints and you was like, yo, that one right <laughs> there? You was like, yo, if you need me on something, I'm with that. And I was like, hell yeah, like let's do it. And then you knocked it out and it's classic, man. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a classic, man. Shout out to my man, Alex G, who directed the video. No doubt. Uh, he, he passed in that uh, that Oakland fire a couple years ago. That was a big thing. Oh, on the wow. News. Yeah, he, he passed about five, six years I'm ago. Sorry that to hear Oakland that. Fire. Yeah, but he, he shot the joint. We was at his man crib, the Brownstone in Sunset Park, I think it was, and all that. But yeah, but um, but anyway, yeah, you know, with Spike, man, Spike was everything, still is, you know, yeah, just the man. storytelling and all that, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Bed Stuy is burning. Yeah. It's dealing with the gentrification. You yeah. and Spike Lee feel the same about the gentrification. I think. Remember that, that uh, clip of him went viral? Talking about his pops. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Let's get into that. You like you don't just rep, rep, represent and reference your father on milestones. You speak about your father a lot on your, throughout your music, throughout your whole career. Yeah. But, you know, you said, I meant, mentioned milestones a little bit, mm -hmm. and the whole Boys in the Hood dialogue. That was my life. Like, like break that down, why you chose that for that record. That record came out last year, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, in quarantine. Yep. Yeah, so, man, break that down. So I had this idea to do a song just about fatherhood and Father's Day and all that, which wound up being a song for fathers. And mm -hmm. I did that. And when just on the playback, listening back to it, I was like, I think I got five or six more of these in me. Mm -hmm. I love the record so much. It was just going to be a one-off okay. just for Father's yeah, yeah, Day. Yeah. I was like, I think I got a couple more of these in me, right, man. Right, you know right, what I right. mean? And, and then the project just took a life of its own, just speaking about my life growing up with a dad and then me raising a son. So taking everything I got from my dad, taking the baton and passing it, and then just that generation and this new generation and how to take what I learned and push it forward. Because I feel like black fatherhood is never really represented in hip-hop. You know, when you think about hip-hop records that talk about fatherhood, there's a few. You can there's, count them on one hand. Yeah, there's Be a Nas, father to your child. Be a father to but, just but the here's two the of thing. us. Right. So right. so let me show you the difference with that. And shout to, you know, Ed O. G and Be a Father mm -hmm. to Your Child. Great record. A lot of the records are about black men who aren't fathers to their kids. Yes. Like that joint, like Be a Father yes. to Your Child and LL Have Father and all these great records, yes. but they're about that. The only records that really was talking about the positive aspect that I can think of off the head, and pardon me to anybody who I may miss, you had Will Smith with, with just the two of us. You know, you had uh, Nas with Daughters. Mm -hmm. And then even in Daughters, he was talking about, yo, I was on the road he's, and he's, certain things slipped yeah, through the cracks. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and that was awesome that he was able to show that honesty, but there's not a lot of positive representation in hip hop for, for black fathers or for fathers in general. My man Terminology does a hell of a job with Good Dad Gang good and all dad that gang, stuff. Right. Absolutely. But I felt like there wasn't enough records. There's a million mother records, which is great. You know, we all need that. Because mothers work very, very hard. I, that's not taking any slight away. That's not taking any <laughs> slight away. I love my mother more than anybody could love their mother. My mother's the best. But at the same time, there's no representation of you. positive fatherhood and hip-hop and i'm like wait a minute every rapper that came out don't got a deadbeat dad that shit is impossible right every it, come on i got a great dad it. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. it's like come on stop it so there wasn't anybody standing tall for us and i just took the, the the charge to stand tall you know and the project took a life of its own and my life was eerily similar to trey and boys in the hood where i moved in with my dad at 10 years old the same conversation trey had with his mom's like well she was like yo i don't want to see you end up like this and this you got to live with your father my mother had the same conversation with me in 1992, where she was like, yeah, you got to live with your Boys dad Boys in the Hood now. came out in 91? 91, yep. I was hired to put up posters for it at the Jacob Javis <laughs> that's Convention awesome. Center that's awesome. for the Black Expo. Yeah, that's awesome. That's how I... I hope you kept one. You know what? I have someone, someone in my in my, in my my things, mm -hmm. I have one of those old posters. I remember it was like, it was Boys in the Hood and Cross Colors. Psst. 
beautiful time. First colors was was uh, 92, 91, 92, beautiful time, man. So, you know, my, my life was eerily similar similar to that. And uh the project just took a life of its own. The best thing about that project is the response that I get from such a wide range of hip hop fans, old, young, whatever. I mean, literally people hit me, yo, I want to cop the vinyl for my dad. He's 60. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I order one from you and you tag it? Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Boom. Like the the range is so nuts. People are like, yo, I played it for my homegirl who is dealing with uh, you know, her baby father, and she don't know whether or not she should let her son live with him, and he's 10, 11 years old. So I played the album for her. It's incredible, man. Like it don't get no doper yeah, than man. that. You know what I mean? That's when the music is really resonating and doing what it's supposed to do. When Rest you... in peace to John Singleton, whose name also comes yes. up on our show a all lot. the time. Absolutely. A lot. I mean, clearly, me using the Boys in the Hood story arc, it wouldn't be without Singleton. You know what I mean? So absolutely, without a doubt. So when your mom let you go live with your father, were you were, was everyone in New York or was he in a different... No, everyone was in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, everyone was in New York. I didn't understand it. I didn't want to go. And I loved my dad. You know, I saw my dad every weekend, spoke to him on the phone every day. I didn't understand it. And I remember my mom and I talking about it and I was like, why? And she was just like, there's certain things that he's going to be able to do for you that I can't. And I didn't get it at 10 years old. And then... Six, seven months into it, when it was time for me to go to my mother house in Crown Heights in Ebbets Field on the weekends, I didn't want to go because I had all my friends in the sty. I didn't want to go. Right. Just like Boys in the Hood. I was like, yeah, I don't want to go to the crib this week. I want to stay here because I had all my friends outside. You know right. what I mean? So it was eerily similar to that, man. It was kind of scary. Right. Now, speaking of growing up in Brooklyn, well, first of all, I don't want to go any further without saying that my friend Seth Bird... He would be very yeah, upset. Yeah, my man. If I, Seth. Seth, you know Seth. My man. He would be very upset if... I didn't mention how much we listened to Range Rover Rhythm. Yeah. Jolly yes, Beats, is. great record. Thank um, you. But speaking of that era of Brooklyn, um, I want to talk a little bit about the movie Strapped. Yeah. You have the song Bamboo, mm -hmm. fan favorite album, Peddler's Themes. The fans yeah. love this album. Thank you, thank you. Um, talk about the impact of seeing our hip-hop heroes do a story that took place in Brooklyn, yeah. that authentic, directed by Forrest, Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker, a lot of people don't know time. that. Yeah, he killed that too. Oh man, I remember just, that was one of the early New York hip-hop street movies. Not hip-hop in a sense of it was about hip-hop, because it wasn't. It was about gun sales and trafficking and straw purchasing and all that. And if you don't know what straw purchasing is, you can Google it, street term. But, um, <laughs> you know, it was about all that type of stuff. But, you know, it was centered in hip-hop because we mm -hmm. ran the culture even back then. Great, great movie, man. And shout to Fredro. Me and Fredro actually got cool after I did the record. When I did mm -hmm. the record, he caught wind of it and reached out. Yo, this shit is crazy. And then I wound up being on the next Onyx album, which was a super honor. Right, right. Um, you know, so it's funny how it works. But you know, when I heard the beat, that just came to me. I mean, tell he bamboo on the steps. Tell him what you can and can't do for a tech. And right. it just because again, this That's is a great a, lyric. Th thank you. Cause this is a world that I I lived in. Like, you know, like I may not have taken part in certain things, but I know that a lot of that stuff like the back of my hand, cause I lived in it. That stuff was next door. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But when you came in my crib, it was Leroy Campbell paintings and it was right. Ronnie Jordan jazz playing. But when I went outside, it was CeeLo on the corner and splitting a hero and a Philly getting rolled up before Duchess. You know, like that was right. the world too. So I had two of these worlds. Phillies are cool, but they burn much quicker. They're too Past big. that blunt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I, I had these two worlds that I, I, mm. I was living in and, and I was figuring out. And uh, yeah, Strapped is 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 an uh, uh, incredible movie. Bamboo is one of my favorite records. Peddler Themes, just the way I was able to put that together and have it be kind of a precursor to a celebration of us, which was one of my favorite records I did just about I wanted to make the blackest album ever with the <laughs> Celebration of Us. That was my my. I'm my looking thing at my question it. that down here says, I want to talk to you about your album, Celebration of Us. Boom, it's your blackest that. album. Yo, <laughs> I told you. Then I say I was like his younger brother. He, he right there. You know, um, yeah, it totally is. I was uh, very inspired by Solange, A Seat at the Table. Mm -hmm. Super duper inspired by yeah, that. I heard yeah. it and was blown away. I was like, yo. You see me crossing this out? This <laughs> covered that. Oh, man. I was like, okay. yo, this album is, 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 is everything. Yeah, and Seat at the Table is the shit. Yeah, it, it, it really And I think is. you did a good job making it sort of a companion piece to that. Yeah, and the funny thing is when it dropped, people were saying that. People was like, yo, this is like the rap version of that. And I was like, wow, y'all got it. It came together full, you know, full circle and all that. I just wanted to make a record that represented us as black folk, the highs and the lows. Yeah. I think people focus on one side or the other side. And I wanted to make a record that showed the ups, the downs, the lefts, the rights, the plights, the things that we've been through, the things that happened to us, the things that we 
let happen or the things we did to ourselves, why we did some of those things to us. Oh, because if you go back 400 years, boom, yeah. boom, boom. I wanted to really try to cover as much as I could. And I felt like it was a super responsibility for me to get it right. Yeah. Because if I didn't get it right, my people would look at me like, yo, fuck is you doing? You know what I mean? Like, and I feel like I nailed it. Um, during press for that album celebration, in an interview with Billboard, you talked about culture vultures and who love the ratchet part of hip hop but can't get with hip hop's spiritual side. It's pretty much like gentrification of music and they want they want our music but not our pain. Mm-hmm. I also say this a lot, drives 100%. me crazy. They love to be black until it's time to be black. Absolutely. Um, you Paul said, Mooney, rest in peace. Yes. You said they live in a make-believe ratchet play world. I love that. I don't they, remember saying that, but that's great. You said I they, still stand tall next to it. Yeah. I just don't remember, but that's but great. Make-believe it, it, it ratchet sounds, play world. When I saw that, I yeah. was like, yo, yeah. that's like a play or mm-hmm. some shit. Like that. You got to do something with that. <laughs> yeah. But it is. It's a lot of, it's a, it, especially with TikTok now. But it's, okay. I'll let, I'll, I'll let you explain the phrase first, and then I'll, mm-hmm. I'll give my take on it. Yeah, please do. Yeah, because, you know, you got these guys who, you know, you can move in Williamsburg and you can go drink a PBR and catch whatever the new ratchet rapper is and who's really living that life, who really got it on him if you lift up his shirt. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you can, you know, be in Williamsburg and drink your PBRs and, you know, have on your (laughs) jean jacket and your brown boots or whatever, whatever, and go crazy to this ratchet hip hop and go home to your nice, comfy one bedroom on the eighth floor in Williamsburg and never have to worry about this life again. So you can exploit that life and talk about how amazing it is when it's a really raw and fucked up life. And this guy got to go home to that if he's not on yet. And if he is on, he got to worry about how to still matter in that world that he used to call home while maneuvering this new world he's learning about. And a lot of times he loses control of it immediately and you don't have to worry about that and all you do is when that's done you go find the next one you know as opposed to figuring out yeah you can enjoy all that but also enjoy this and how the two come together and why this is this and that's that and the way they play it within one another and the way that they don't you can't just cover one side of it yeah and that's my biggest problem with it and then all of that stuff led to me making the new record all the brilliant things because i just was really really tired of it i really was really tired of gentrification and cultural appropriation in the way the two go hand in hand. And it just pushed me almost to like a brink of like, yeah, nah, enough is enough. I agree with you 100%. But then on the other side, some of these people, they don't even know that they're culture vulturing. Like right. this new it's the norm. generation. It's the norm. Exactly. Right. It's mm-hmm. the norm. So it's like, I feel where you're coming from, but it's like a certain generation that did that. And now it's kind of like getting away yeah. because they don't even know, you know, where right. it started. Well, we lost control of it. And the funny thing is that when it comes to us as a people, when it comes to folk who look like us, we're the only creators of, of different cultures that it happens to. Mm-hmm. Right? Like when over we create over. something, jazz, R&B, hip hop, whatever, when we create something, it happens to us. It don't happen to anyone else who doesn't look like us and create certain things. These, We don't go in there and take over the, you know, what they got going on and exploit it and tell them how to do it. We don't go in there and tell them how to make grunge and heavy metal. We just enjoy it. If you look like me and you enjoy heavy metal, you just enjoy it. And if it's an artist or whatever it is that you may not like what they did in heavy metal, mm-hmm. you don't like that and you right. keep it moving, but you still enjoy it and you appreciate and respect it. People come into our worlds... I don't like that, and here's why, and here's why you're wrong, and here's why you're not representing your culture right and your thing right, and here's what you should do to change it, and you suck, and you don't know about your culture. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. You know what I mean? Like The example I give people all the time when I talk about the new record, I'm like, imagine me telling a 75-year-old Italian grandma how to make chicken parm and spaghetti. The audacity. Right, 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 right. I could never. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't like the way she flavored that, this woman been making that stuff for 60-something years since she was a teenager. The audacity of me to go in there and tell her, nah, this ain't real Italian food. You don't know what you're doing. I could never. I could either enjoy it or not and keep it moving. But with us, they come in and tell us what's real and what's not. They come in and tell us, nah, that ain't right. You ain't doing that right. You shouldn't even be allowed to do this no more because you don't know what you're doing. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. You know what I mean? You've been on my block six months, B. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, you just learned what a chopped cheese was. Hold up. You know what I mean? Hold up, hold up, hold up. What, what are we doing? You know what I mean? Right. And you're flaunting it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and that's... That's the problem that us as folk, as, as black folk, what we allow, mm-hmm. but other people don't. 
you know, and, and it's time to put a stop to all that, you know. And what I want to get across to people when they hear the new record, it's not about, yo, if you're not black, you're not going to like the record. If you white, I'm coming at you. Not at all. Some of my biggest fans, some of my best friends don't look like me. Some of my biggest supporters don't look like me. But they know at the same time, yo, he's doing that the way he does it, and I appreciate it. Or if I'm not a fan of it, I'm not a fan of it. But I can never go in there and tell him, that ain't New York enough. That ain't hip-hop enough. That ain't right. black enough. Like, they know that, you know? So it's not a, a black or white thing. It's just understanding what it is, respecting it, and letting that be that. It don't mean you have to love everything that we do. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I don't love every soul food restaurant, and I'm black. Some yeah. soul food restaurants you go to is trash. You know what I mean? But you know, the foods just slop together. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it's... Appreciate it for what it is or don't, but don't dare come in and tell us what we're doing right or wrong. You're not from it. You you can't. You won't get it. That's right. Sky Zoo, man. This guy plays well with others. <laughs> he does. He plays oh, well with man. I mean, you got Apollo Brown. Yeah. Your knife Wonder. You, you know, Rock. um Pete Rock, Ill Retropolitan, Bill Mine, Torre. Yeah, my brother Torre. Shout out Absolutely. to Torre the Barrel Brothers. Yeah. Um, you went on tour with El Zai mm -hmm. for the Retropolitan tour. Yeah. And you lost your voice on this tour. Yes. Scary fucking prospect for a rapper. It was awful. Um, you did a whole show in which you lip synced the whole show. Worst show ever. He lip synced the whole show because he lost his voice. Worst show ever. Nilly vanilly. Nilly vanilly. Worst show ever. Yeah. But, but no, the, but it's a it's a it's a noble gesture. Yeah, because yes. you tried. It's a you no did because your the best. people came out to yeah. see him. Yep. So I'm still gonna perform. Exactly. Yep. And Instead then you, you gave out mer free merch. Free merch. Noble gesture. Yeah. Um, I mean, look. I lost my voice and had I didn't have to get surgery, okay. but I had to change my habits. Wow. Buster Rhymes famously had the polyps. Mm -hmm. We had DMC here the other mm -hmm. day. He completely lost his voice. Yeah, you know he went suicidal, depressed mm. after that. Yeah. So what was going on in your mind when that happened? Just the scariest thing in the world. You know, uh, I started feeling it on the tour. I toured a lot off that album. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2019. Uh, the Retropolitan joined and we just wanted to really just give it to the people and really just make it work and, and make it make sense and I give my all when I do a show you know people know me in person yo Sky's mad laid back and cool when I get on stage I turn into a mini red and meth show like I'm all right. over the place bouncing it's like yo oh snap I didn't know he had that much energy and I didn't know he drank that much Kool-Aid to bounce around the stage right, right. like that you know what I mean so you know I give my all at a show and it was so many shows back to back to back and I started feeling it a little bit you do a show at the end of the night, you got a little scratch. It's all right. You wake up in the morning, it's gone. You're good to go. Mm -hmm. That's part of touring and whatever, whatever. You drink some tea, you keep it moving. And it started getting really bad. And then we was in Oklahoma City, and it was gone, man. And the whole way there, I'm drinking mad hot toddies. I'm liquor mm -hmm. the tea, and I'm going crazy. So now I'm buzzed backstage because I've been drinking so mm -hmm. much on the drive there because everybody's like, yo, add this with the hot tea, and you'll be good. And it's gone, man. And I remember just telling... My man Rashid Hadi, I, you know, he was spending that night for me, and I was like, "Yo, just play the album, man. I just just play the album, and I'm gonna go out there and tell these people when this whisper, I don't have a voice, but I can't leave y'all all paid twenty five dollars a ticket, blah blah blah. It's packed in here. I can't leave y'all like that, and hopefully this thing go right, and y'all tomato me. You know what I mean? Now if we was in New York, they would have tomato me. They'd be like, "Yo, you wildin'? I ain't come for this bomb." You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, but we was in Oklahoma City, so they was cool. You was important. A New York rap experience to them. You was like, yeah, a, a they, good, they, they, they a good respected German it. Beer. They, they, like, they respected it. I'm gonna it. drink this German beer. But yeah, they respected yeah. it and they was all for it. And I was so, you know, I was so in love with that. I told everybody, yo, if you stick around and ride with me through this, I'll make it worth it. And I literally gave everybody free merch at the end of the night. And people was coming to me to buy merch. And I was like, put your money away. Here, here. You know, well, I couldn't say it, but I was just telling them, yo, put, you know, and I gave everybody free merch, lost mad money, but it was worth it because what I didn't lose was fans. Mm -hmm. What I didn't lose was support. So I was cool losing all that paper it was all right you didn't you know? even lose any paper exactly i gained yeah now you want to go out there and buy everything because you like your yep. son held it down he power i was waiting for somebody to post a video or a picture at that night <laughs> clapping me i was waiting right. for it so nothing but you not let them know one. so they couldn't even do it not a single yeah. one everything was love yo skies who came to okc and killed it boom 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 and it was dope and then we had a couple more shows fought through it Thank God my voice came back a little bit. When I went home, I went to the doctor. They told me I had the polyps, blah, blah, blah. They wanted to, you know, see if it was cancerous. Thank God it wasn't, whatever, whatever. And then I got it out, and, you know, I was down for like a month. I couldn't speak for like a month, whatever, whatever. Whoa. Now I'm back, you know. But the, the thing you said about DMC, which is so crazy, shout out to him, of course. You know, I remember the first time recording after the surgery, and the doctor was like, yo, you free, you can do it. 
and it felt weird. And I was like, yo, I think I might tap out. Mm, I think wow. I might be done. Because it felt weird. It's kind of like if you play ball and you tear your ACL and they say, all right, you clear to go now. Your first time back on the court, you super rusty. Mm-hmm. You ain't and nervous. Your handle ain't right and, you know, you're not shooting the same. So the pen was still moving. The pen never stopped flying. But when I got in the booth, the way I would exude the records and kind of like just record and put everything out, it just didn't seem right. And I was like, yo, I think I might tap out. But after a week, I was back to normal and everything was smooth. Word up. Man. This is so dope. I'm having such a good time talking to you. Thank you, brother. Um, another thing we share is a deep love for jazz music. Yeah. In 2020, you dropped Milestones, which we spoke about, which has had a lot of... You have a lot of horns and arrangements of strings. Every, every record, record, right? Yep. But the bluest note, I feel like you lean more into it. Mm-hmm. The jazz influence is so prevalent in everything you do. And I've heard you yeah. talk about Miles Davis, Coltrane, Wayne Shorter, yeah. um, Horace Silver. Mm-hmm. For someone who is not familiar with jazz, who listens to hip hop, yeah. besides the people I named, I, I probably should let you name them, but yeah. <laughs> tell us, give us like a jazz for dummies in terms of Sky Zoo's oh, jazz man. for dummies. Everybody you named, so mm-hmm. Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Horace Silver, Wayne Shorter, Ahmad Jamal, Lee Morgan, Stanley Turrentine, Freddie Hubbard, this goes on and on, you know? Right. Uh, my jazz vinyl collection is out of control. Out of control, man. Like, if people saw it, they would be like, nah, nah, you're not a rapper with that type of jazz right. collection. You produce, right? Nah, I don't produce. You just got those because you got them? Yeah, like, I'm just a jazz head, you know? Like, And it came from my pops and it came from Spike. You know, Mo' Better Blues is top three all time for me. Mo' Better makes it Mo' Better. Yeah, top three all time for me. So, you know, I remember as a kid, and you gonna know, cause you from New York, you from the era. I was a kid and my pops would drop me off by the train and he would have on CD 101.9. CD 101.9, yep, yeah, it is. <laughs> be and, cool. Yep, and, and, and I, would, I would change <laughs> it to Hot 97. Tab. I would change it to Hot 97 and we would like argue back and forth. He'd be like, stop touching the radio. I'd be like, this music is stupid. There's not even any words on it. Cause I was a writer since forever. Right. So I was like, there's not even any words on this. This music is stupid. And he was like, one day you're gonna love this stupid music. And dear God, man, I fell right. I probably was like Bobby freshman McFerrin in college. Bobby McFerrin sang that song. Mm. CD yes, one, I knew CD that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, it was an old jazz network. I mean, radio yeah, station. it was a jazz radio station. In New it York. was the first smooth jazz record smooth that set up jazz. the format for smooth jazz radio throughout the country. Okay, yeah. wow, that part I didn't know. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah, and and I I fell in love with it, man. Around college year, I really fell in like freshman year of college. Really fell in love with it and started buying vinyl and you know so I made it my business to be like yo every record I'm gonna have live horns trumpets all that shout out to my man Sean Taylor who plays on every record of every album of mine he plays a live trumpet on my stuff and uh, yeah I, I just fell in love with it man so going to Dumbo Station like you said I was on tour with Apollo 2017 or something like that I was on tour with Apollo Brown we was in Italy and. This dude, Dom, comes up to me who I didn't know. He's like, yo, I got a, a label out here called Tough Kong and uh, would love to do a record with you. And I was like, okay, what's up? He was like, I got a jazz band and I would love to do a record with the two of y'all. And I was already in. I was like, oh, pfft. I've wanted to do a Roots type record my whole life. Yeah. I've wanted to do a live band, all jazz my whole life. What's up? Let me hear something. And then he sent me a link to them and they were crazy. It was called Dumbo Station. They were nuts. I said, bro, sign me up. Let's do it. And we figured it out. I went to Italy. I did the whole thing in like six days and we knocked it out. And, dope. you know, the dope thing about that record is everything is live instrumentation. It's all jazz. And I actually co-wrote a lot of those arrangements. So I would go to each musician and be like, yo, play the bass like this. Yo, play right. the drums like this. Yo, play the trumpet like this. And I was kind of Quincy Jones and all that stuff with them. And they just took it to a whole nother level. That's funny because we had Terrace Martin here, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, I was like, yo, you familiar with Sky Zoo? He's like, oh, yeah, Sky Zoo, dope. And they said, but Sky Zoo be writing for a lot of people. And then he said, he said, hey, but, hey, Brody, hustle cold-blooded. He said, he'll pull up behind you and be like, yo, you know I write R&B, too. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said that, when you like, I wrote the arrangements, right. I heard Terrence, Terrence was like, he said, Sky Zoo would be like, yo, you know I write R&B, too. Yeah, I write it all, man. I'm with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I write it all. That pen fly for everything. But no doubt. Yeah, so jazz head, man. I listen to more jazz than hip-hop. I believe uh, it. Literally, I listen to more jazz. My son, my son don't really hear that much hip-hop. He's three. He's in the car seat. He don't hear that much hip-hop. You know, he hear guys like you, he mm. guys like me, he hear some Griselda, he hear Tribe, of course, he hear Illmatic and Big and all you that. You got but a lot of work with Griselda, too. Those are my brothers. Those are my brothers. Yeah, yeah, I need to get on um, your level because my daughter only dances to ratchet music. But, um, I'll, yeah, you got to switch that I'll up. I'll make you a playlist. You know what Please a lot of people do? do. 
a lot of rappers, a lot of fellow rappers, they'll hit me and be like, yo, Scott, can you make me a playlist, a jazz playlist? Yes. Some of them will be like, yo, I got a girl coming through. I'm trying to flex. Whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Right, right. And I'll be like, yeah, I got you. And I'll make a little 20-song playlist for them, straight jazz, Coltrane, right. Amar Jamal, Miles, and all that. And boom, you know, so I'll make you a playlist. And, yes, and, and are you on Spotify? I have a playlist on Spotify Ooh, called Sunday Morning Jazz. Yes, I'm so gonna if you get go on Spotify and just yep. look up Sunday Morning Jazz, all those playlists are me. Oh, bet. I'm going to do that. So it's already done. It's like 20 playlists up there. Already. And it reminds me of myself. Anyway, um, you have a lot of, you have a lot of ghostwriting work and um, writing songs with Ill Mind. Mm -hmm. Can we get a little bit deeper into that? Like, what is the actual yeah. job of a ghostwriter? And we had Jada Kiss, one of my favorite interviews, and he told us about writing Puff's verse on All About the Benjamins. So after you tell us what the job of ghostwriting is, can you tell us about any songs that we didn't know that is definitely ghostwritten? Absolutely not. <laughs> that part I can't do. You <laughs> that can't part spill I can't any do. tea. No, not a little right. bit. Not I a little appreciate drizzle. you shooting your shot. I appreciate <laughs> you shooting. I respect that. You know what I mean? Um, Try yeah, to ease it in. We can get into the first part of the question. Yeah, um, Ill Mind got me into ghostwriting. What happened was, uh, I always felt like that's I was, what Terrence said too. He said he be fucking with Ill Mind. They be writing the ill shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Measy's my name. brother, man. That's that's my brother for real, for real, man. Um, so what happened was, I always felt like I could write for people. Just as an MC, as a lyricist, you always feel like I could have did better than that. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. ever since a kid, I would hear something in high school and be like, I, I could have killed that. And you, especially if you know a certain people who don't write, you'd be like, oh, I could have, I could have blessed son better than that. Pause. Mm -hmm. So um, as time went on and getting in. My my career and all that type of stuff, Ill Mind started doing some production work with mm -hmm. certain people that needed verses. And he actually came out to LA and was doing some work with some people. He came back home to Brooklyn. So when he was living, he used to live two blocks away from me in the style for a minute. So he came back home and was like, yo, Sky, I was with so-and-so. Yo, they need work. Yo, you got to come out. Next time I go to LA, just come with me. Boom, boom. I was like, bet. So before that, my issue was I was trying to get into ghostwriting and I would meet other people who was ghostwriters, and I was trying to get in through them. Like, oh, word, yo, you working with so-and-so? Yo, when you're in a session, give me a call. I'll come through, and we'll write. And they'd be like, yeah, 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 no doubt, no doubt. And I wouldn't get the call. <laughs> because, and I, I was naive at, at the time, I'm an artist who tours, works with mad different producers, works with people like yourself, mad different people. A lot of ghostwriters in hip-hop are rappers who didn't make it. Mm. Not all. But a lot of them are rappers who didn't make it. Right. They was trying to go, and they super nice, but it was something. Either their voice Stage was weird, presence. they look didn't really sell, whatever it was. They may be kind of an introvert. A lot of them are rappers who didn't make it, but their pen was crazy, so they just jumped into that. Sky Zoo is a rapper who quote-unquote made it. He tours whenever he wants, he sells merch, he goes and does shows with everybody, and he makes records with whoever he wants. Now this guy's trying to come in on this side of the table and eat my food? I'm not helping son out. So yeah. I was naive thinking these guys was going to call me, yo, I got so-and-so in the lab. I'm writing. Come through. Write with me. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the call and it never happened. Right. It was Ill Mind who's a producer. I'm not stepping on his food, uh, on his toes. He not step We're not eating each other food. Yeah. You got your plate. Preparing I got mine. Together. You know what I mean? We yeah. need right. each other. Right. So it, it took that. And um, he called me and, and, and brought me out, you know, and I came out to L.A. and I started writing for somebody and that turned into writing for somebody else. Somebody, in the course of a weekend, I had like four different people that it was just flying. And I was like, yo, this is exactly what I was looking for. And it just snowballed. So now it's just like job one and job 1A. Like, right. as much as I write for myself, I'm writing for other people. That's dope. How do you capture the pin voice of other rappers? Uh, I listen to a lot of what they already did. I tap into them vocally and sonically and, you know, all that type of stuff. And like I said, I do everything tailor-made. A lot of times I could listen to a record that somebody else wrote, and I could tell who wrote it. I go, oh, so-and-so wrote that. Because it just sounds like them. Right. It sounds like a record they could have spit themselves, but they just sold it to whoever. Right. And I refuse to do that. And you know the community of writers at this point. So. Right, exactly. And and my thing is, it's a tailor-made suit. So if you come into my my you know my tailor shop and all that, you're like, yo, I want a yellow suit with brown and purple dots. I want to look like Steve Harvey. I right. <laughs> like, I, won't, I would never wear that. Right. But if that's what you want, I, I can make it. I'll hook it up. Yeah. So it's the same thing where this is suited just for you. You want some trap shit, you want some so-and-so. I would never say all this, but cool. You know what I mean? Like, if you know my music, you know I don't use the N-word, like, ever. Yeah. But Yeah, you don't ever, and that's ever. impressive. Thank you. Why but is when, that? I mean, that's probably a whole different discussion. I don't knock anybody who does. I just look at the history of it, and I look at the weight that it holds, and I don't feel it's worth the trade-off. Mm -hmm. I feel like 
it was this, but then we turned it into that. But is it worth the trade off when you have people who don't look like us? That's like, well, you guys said it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's worth the trade off. But that's me personally. That's not a knock on anybody. Well, it's my brother Qua. Anybody else who uses it. It's not a knot. It's hey, just what, my what, how person. How did I get involved in this? No, I'm just saying. You're using the word. Say, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> but, you know, so, so that's just me. But just going back to the writing, I don't talk about certain things. I don't use the word. But if I'm writing for somebody, I'm not like, you. yo, yeah. you know, I'm going to write this for you, but I can't use the N-word. Cause that, nah, man, you came in this tailor shop and you want this yellow suit. Well, what a, hey, that's what you right. want to wear. Let's do it. That's you know interesting because you're not saying that. You're not like it's not like I can't I can easily do this. Mm -hmm. I just choose not to. Mm -hmm. And That's, I, and right. I challenge myself as an artist mm -hmm. cuz now I've re removed a crutch for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of rappers got off with rhymes. They rhyme wasn't hot, but because they said nigga at the end of it. Yeah. So you'd be like, it's yeah. the easiest thing to lean on. Right. As I, a rapper. Right. Yo, it's the easiest I'm word to lean on. I'm sitting on my couch, on. nigga. You right. act like a grouch, nigga. It's the I'm easiest like, word to ouch, lean nigga. on. Like, it's like. It's so crazy. It's the easiest word to lean on, yeah. man. And, you know, so for me, you know, that's a lot of what, uh, when you mentioned the record earlier, I was supposed to be a trap rapper. A lot of that is about that. Like, I could go this way, but I, but yeah. I choose not. That's why at the end, I flipped it and threw the trap record and in you, there. You rap like a trap rap rapper. 100%. I okay. encourage everybody to listen to this song. It's a great song. Thank you. I'm glad you have this new album out. Um, I love the album, uh, the cover for St. James Liquors. Yeah. It brings me back to, because yeah. I used to buy liquor from that liquor store. Yeah, and now it's a pharmacy. Yeah. Which is nice, because a pharmacy's nice, and it's needed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it just reminds me of... Uh, of, of what it was. That's right. Liquor was our pharmacy back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was this. See, mine's still, gone. It's still a pharmacy. <laughs> Mine's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. All the brilliant things. Mm -hmm. Sky Zoo. It's an honor, our pleasure to have you. I do have one more question. Yes, please. Before I let you get out of here. Please. There's a conversation that's being had amongst the black culture, which mm -hmm. I know you're very invested in. Mm -hmm. Is Snowfall better than The Wire? Whew. That is a jo that's, that's a Jordan <laughs> Kobe question. Mm. Um, I am a huge Snowfall fan. Yes, oh my! Same. And I got on late. Me too. Like I said, like you said earlier, I, I'm not ashamed to say what it is or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. I got on late. And when I saw what it was about, that's up my alley. Anything right. talking about moving and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Because as much as I am this English major guy, I still grew up in this certain place with these guys. That's my thing. Like I'm like, oh, we talking about that? I'm all is like, right. let, cause let's break down why break it it's the way it is, not mm -hmm. glorifying it, but let's break it down. Like, yeah. So I'm all about that. And it's Singleton, right? Absolutely. So I got, I got put onto it late. I kept seeing it was, I gotta tap in. I gotta tap in. And it was a couple months ago. Something just said, do it. And I was like, you know what? Let me get this Hulu popping and just do right. it. I was up till six thirty every morning. Oh yeah, banging that out. Mm. I was like, yo, this is insane. I couldn't stop. Like, I was emotionally invested in yes. it. Like I was I, on from first episode. I saw the first episode when it debuted, right. and I, I was just in. Right. Yeah. And I know that would have been me. If mm -hmm. I would have saw it from day one, I know that would have been mm -hmm. me. I'm glad I didn't, because that waiting every week thing. I was it waiting. Yeah, I, I mean, did like, 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 That waiting every week sucks. thing, because yeah. I had to do that with season four. Mm -hmm. yes, because once I got horrible. one through three, it was right when four started. And now I got to wait every week. And Same, now I'm sitting there yes. at 10 o'clock. And what I would do, <laughs> I would wait till 10, 20 so that I could fast forward commercials. Right, right, you know what I mean? Right. Like, well, see, I'll wait. I'll give it a buffer. I had to wait too because I, I like watched Snowfall with a friend the mm -hmm. whole the season four. So like mm -hmm. we watched every episode together right. virtually. So like right. I had to wait. But one through three, I binged. And I yeah, was just like, oh too. my God. How? No, I couldn't stop. It was like, uh, it was amazing. what time is it? I right. gotta get my son up at seven thirty. <laughs> I could do another hour. I'd be all right. You know right. what I mean? And it was like six in the morning, and I was I was watching Snowfall. Like this was crazy. Like I I felt like day. Franklin is my cousin. Like yes. I said, if I meet if I meet Damson Idris. I don't want to hear that British accent, bro. I need <laughs> you. Know, I need like you that. to speak like Franklin Saint from <laughs> South right. Central. If I meet Son right now so, in Hollywood, I need him to speak like Franklin. B. Two things. Number one, go back and watch the first episode. I'm on it, holding a baby. I was a teen mom on there. She's, on Snowfall, on she was a crackhead. Really she really is. Everything. I used to she do really background. She really is a part of everything. Bro. I told you, I'm not lying, this, that's crazy. I'm dead you thought ass. I was bullshit. That's crazy. I'm dead ass. I'm not. I'm not a liar. You are a Renaissance I'm, black woman. Listen. <laughs> when I finally, I've done, yes, I do background on it, but I also stood in on it too. And when I heard his British accent, I was so fucking confused. Yeah. So I'm like, this dude is not from here. Yeah. No, it's crazy. I think with that show, and I think people will agree now because they four seasons in, 
I don't think they could have got somebody from South Central to do a better job than Son. He and that's crazy. Like that's wild because it's like, yo, he's a great actor. Y- Even with amazing, the, the having to use the cane the whole yeah. season. Nah, like, he's that amazing, takes a man. Lot. He's he's a different type of guy, man. Like that. Hats go off to him 100, percent man. And that and that whole staff. Back to the wire. The wire is everything for me. Right, real quick because yeah. have you seen him? Doing his Jay Z impersonation? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because you a Brooklyn dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. keep I going. Pe- keep you going. The, the you saw him do the Kendrick impersonation? Nah, I need to check Crazy. it out. Crazy. Okay, he was on Jimmy Kimmel. I'm gonna check it out. And he talked about meeting Kendrick, and then he impersonated what Kendrick sound like when they was conversing. <laughs> and yo, he kills that. I'm like, okay. yo, He's what? Amazing. Like you, Jay Farrow? Like you got everybody? Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like right. f all those people that made him deactivate his Twitter. They canceled Jay Farrow? No, no, not Jay Farrow. Dams and he he uh oh he said something about his Twitter because he said. Something about um, something about getting curved or something like that, and then he wrote, "I don't get curved," and then like women just started. Attacking I didn't see that part. He said, "I think he said something like, ladies, if you if a guy is hitting you in DMs all the time and you know you're not gonna give him any type of correspondence, why don't you just let him know?" Yeah, he that responded was some, that to that. Was and sort he, of what I saw. Yeah, but they responded to that, and he was like, "I don't get curved. I'm just asking a question." And <laughs> I mean, nothing wrong with patting it's yourself on the back. Like, it's not wrong with anything. It's not Twitter's over anyway. Think, it's been over since I was kicked off Twitter. Yeah, it's like well, it's, <laughs> it's not, not wrong with Pat. I haven't been on Twitter. I, I, since I mean, since anyone people... who's still on Twitter is whack. I said it. I said what I said. <laughs> That's what they say on Twitter, right? When they don't want to justify what they said. No, Nene actually said what I said. That was Nene leaks. But. Yeah, right, because she didn't want to justify whatever bullshit she had said. I said what I said. <laughs> but you know, I'm 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 a huge Wire fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, think, you are. I think the Wire is the greatest show ever written. It's incredible, man. I mean, the layers of it. As somebody who rhymes in layers and double and triple entendres and you'll get the shit later. Listen now, you'll get it now, but you'll get more the more you listen. That's the Wire, and a lot of my writing style too comes from from David Simon. Uh, who I think is just an absolute goat. So it's hard to compare the two, man, because The Wire is so realistic. And there's certain things that Snowfall does that The Wire would never do, like dream sequences Snowfall and flashbacks. And is Snowfall is more television. Yeah. It's more, more traditional. But this yeah. season, they started throwing that stuff in. That wasn't, they weren't doing like dream sequences. No, originally. but even before the dream sequences, Snowfall, John Singleton has a very and the people he works with and chooses to work with right. very cinematic Hollywood eye absolutely people who grew up in LA they grew up in proximity of always seeing that Hollywood sign right. so it's always like I always like the, like Boys in the Hood mm-hmm. like just the way the cinematic value of it Snowfall is an interpretation mm-hmm. Snowfall is someone's writing based on what they saw The Wire was taken from actual we events. was in it. We was in it. You know what I mean? It was like, yo, we was in it, and we're just retelling, we're just recalling, we're yeah. just telling the story. The Wire is using a lot of real names and all that. Yeah, yeah. Snowfall ain't doing anything. I need right. to go back and watch. I need yeah. to go watch that. Oh uh, yeah, The Wire is amazing. So you can't compare them, man. I, I don't think it's first season fair. of The Wire had a couple Black Star songs. In it. A ton of them. Yeah, y'all were all over that yeah. season, be like, yeah. y'all got like eight songs on there. Yeah. You know what I mean? There like, was somebody working at, and it wasn't accurate because no drug dealers in in that area of Baltimore <laughs> would be listening to Black Star at right. that time. You so it was know. just somebody who worked on the show mm-hmm. who was a Black Star fan. I don't know who this person was. I th- I thought it was that, and I also thought it was possibly budget stuff, mm-hmm. like. You got to pay Def Jam or Sony, right, whatever, but right. Raucous may be a little that more feasible in the budget. Right. I thought that was a big part of it, too, because later whole on- There's a Wire episode about how you know these niggas is not from Baltimore because you start playing the go-go music. Mm-hmm. You plus start playing certain, start saying certain shit. Right. These New York niggas trying to come down. Right. And you know they're not from there. And then the New, York, when the New York kid got popped. Right. Season he, four. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I always looked at that, but I love that y'all was all over it. I was like, yeah, yo, me they, too. they all over the joint. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. You know what I, mean? I was like, yo, they all over the joint. Yeah. And, that, and that's history, man. But you can't, I don't think it's fair to compare Snowfall to the Y because they just stood for so many different things while standing for the same thing, so if that makes gonna, sense. You know what I mean? It does. We're going to have to judge like maybe 10 years from now and see which one people are still well, watching. Well, Snowfall season four, The Wire is five seasons. Yeah. And um, I, so I feel like we're done with the podcast by now. Um, so I'm going to say <laughs> thank you, you gonna, for having Sky no. Zoo on People's <laughs> we Party. We can do whatever. Because I feel like we're going to go somewhere night. Totally We can do whatever. Different. We can do whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah.